children of God, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Now, I thank our God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus the Christ, that in everything, children, you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. As the word transforms you so that you won't be lacking in any gift, as you await upon the coming of our Lord Jesus the Christ. My friends, welcome to the Master's Touch master class. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Okay, um, these classes, folks, are designed to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God, and I'm going to take you from the beginning to our eternal beginning, in depth, in God's Word, revealing His plan and purpose for your life, how He mapped it out, why he designed it that way, and into who you are in Christ, what power you have, why you have it, and how to operate in it, as God designed for you to. Now, you won't want to miss any of these classes. However, if you can't make it to the virtual classroom, then know that these are archived in Spreaker.com and on the website, www.themasterstouch.org. That's there for your convenience so that you can go back and study at your leisure. God bless you richly as we begin. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts flowing through our lips. We exalt and praise you and your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for our Lord and Savior, our only Son, your only Son, uh, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on your behalf and on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, we've begun at the beginning, and today we're going to continue on in depth looking into the blessing. Let's recap from the beginning again so that we all are on the same page. We started our series on the blessing, which is our empowerment by God. And that empowerment is to prosper in all that we do, and we're placed here to accomplish in God's plan for our lives. The blessing does specific things within that empowerment. It sets up the Garden of Eden in our lives. The blessing goes before you and kills the weeds and the things that don't belong in the garden. It weeds out the sin in your life and destroys it before it has a chance to overtake you or tangle you up in its vine-like tendrils. It goes before you weeding out the sin, avariciously going after the things that are not of God and removing them from your path so that you won't stumble. We all want to do that, don't we? Of course we do. We want that. Uh, and we wrapped up last week's uh, program when we were just about to find out how to activate the blessing in our lives. <laughs> Cliffhanger. We kept you hanging. <laughs> so we're going to pick up there and begin by making the statement that the way we activate the blessing in our lives is quite simply the way God did in Genesis. We speak it into action. That's right. We speak it by thanking God daily for the blessing. And it's that thanksgiving that activates it. Each time you see the blessing remove an obstacle, well, give thanks to God for Jesus having restored the blessing to you. Now watch yourself prosper in health, wealth, and signs and wonders, because it's truly amazing. Once you start, there will be no stopping. Remember this, we have God's DNA, we are created in His likeness, we look like Him, and in His image we have His characteristics and attributes. He gave us His power and His authority, and now He expects us to act like Him, to talk like Him, to walk in the blessing like Him, and when we do, we are in Him, and He is in us. As Jesus said to him in John 17, 21, they that, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. So let's take a quick look again at faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'm going to take this slow, because I may have to repeat it for you. Remember this. Now faith is seeing what you hoped for becoming a reality. What qualifies now as now? Hope for. Hope for is converted into evidence. And the evidence is converted into substance. When that happens, it becomes now. Do you see it? Let me see if I can illustrate. We'll say that our hope for is for an evil report from the doctor of sickness and disease to be untrue. 
We have the evidence to support that it is untrue. What is our evidence? Jesus died on the cross and took all sickness and all disease so we didn't have to bear it. So because we have that evidence, the finished work of Jesus at the cross in the Bible, we have faith in what we hope for. Now we can stand firmly on that faith and it becomes now. What do I mean by that? It manifests. Now this law applies to all things that we have hope for. We hope for our loved ones to be saved. It converts to evidence. Our evidence is what the word says about it. Then manifestation now. Let's see if we can put together what happened. Jesus, when he walked the earth, exercised his covenant rights. He knew that the blessing still existed and was his empowerment to prosper. Now, in operating in that power of the blessing, that was his and ours, all right? He brought the future into the now. This is our reality. Now faith is seeing what we hope for becoming reality. Simple as that. Now, I want to remind you again that we are learning what the blessing is and how to operate it in our own lives. So let's move on into declaring, shall we? Now the purest definition of the word declare is to bring something forth. When Jesus died on the cross for our salvation, he was bringing something forth from one realm into another. You don't need to bring something forth that already exists where you are. So where exactly does the stuff that we're bringing forth come from? The supernatural realm the spirit realm, the heavenlies, our home, our reality. The blessing tells us that we have the same creative power as God has. He gave it to us when he created us. Now, as we gain revelation knowledge of the working of the blessing in our lives, then, uh, and when we put it into operation, you know, we start using it, start practicing it, we are able to declare or bring forth from another realm into this realm the manifestation of the things we hope for, which there is evidence of. Where? In the Word of God. Now, in Genesis, when God created Adam, he gave him the blessing, which is God's dominion and God's authority. The blessing is our evidence. Therefore, we can declare or call forth those things we desire, the desires of our heart, and they will manifest into the natural realm, into the now faith realm. Faith is simply the vehicle used to reach into the supernatural realm. As we declare with our mouths using God's creative power given to us, we put into operation with our tools, our mouths, the blessing. The blessing then goes to work to create something. What is it? The Garden of Eden, perfection in every area of our lives. And in that atmosphere, the glory of God, our manifested hope for, becomes tangible matter here in the natural, and we have received what we were standing in faith for. We spoke it, it manifested, and then we saw what we said. That's what happened to God when he created, remember? He spoke it, and it manifested, and then he saw what he said, and he said it was good. Okay. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. He had brought something forth. What was it? Oh, dear me. Hang on just a second. I've got to get rid of this sound. I forgot to turn my, my microphone down to zero. Sorry, folks. This is stupid of me. Well, quit it. I just want to do this and that. There we go. All right. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so what I was saying is when Jesus was on the cross, he said it was it is finished. He brought something forth. Now, what was it? It was the reinstatement of the blessing into the sons and daughters of God. He brought it back from the pit of hell, from the supernatural into the natural realm and gave it back to us. He gave us back the blessing that was Adam's originally. Our dominion and authority was restored back to us. Why? So that we could once again begin to operate in that power that had been given to Adam thousands of years prior. It was reestablished here on earth so that we, Abraham's seed, generations of his offspring, could once again operate in the law of the blessing. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Do you understand? Does this help you? Let's move on. I need to explain what a measure is. Now, according to the dictionary, a measure is an amount. However, in the Hebrew language, a measure is your sphere or circle of influence and rule. Okay, here's the issue. Where is faith's measure of rule? Well, once again, we go to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. 
the evidence of things not seen. So faith's measure of rule is not the matter you see. It is not the things we see with our eyes. It is not the things that are already in our vision or line of physical sight. Faith's measure of rule is in the realm that supersedes the matter or the things that you can see with the physical eye. Faith's measure of rule is the unseen. It's another realm. And here's the problem with the body of Christ today. We are not seeing into the supernatural realm. We are merely confessing. We are trying to call into manifestation what we have not seen. We have mistaken faith for presumption. Watch this now. Jesus said, I only say those things that I hear my Father say and what I see. All right. John 5.19 says, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So, let's take faith away from grace. Now what do we have? Only works. So it's not a matter of how much faith you have. It's because of what God has already done. By grace, you're saved. How does this happen? It happens through faith. The hope for thing, salvation, will come to pass because it was already established through faith. And listen closely, it wasn't your faith that established it. It was Jesus' faith at the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he had to have faith that he wouldn't be forsaken. That what he believed, the Father's promise and covenant, was his exactly like we do. He did. And he said, it is finished. It is established. It is reestablished because of Jesus' faith. And we can have faith now to see the evidence manifest in our own lives by knowing beyond any doubt, with absolute certainty, that the word of God is truth. Jesus proved it by reestablishing the blessing in our lives. Now, all we need to do is get a working knowledge of the blessing into our head so that it can become heart knowledge. And then we will become so powerful that the enemy will have no ability to deceive us even. You couldn't manifest anything by yourself if you tried, folks. It's all a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So let's go further into our understanding, shall we? Now, you don't have any faith in what you possess or really tangibly have. Faith's measure is the unseen. Faith's measure is the rule, the statute, not the seen, but the unseen. In other words, faith opens to us the world, the realm, the zone that was before time. Do you know why God gave man faith? Because when he locked man out of the Garden of Eden, unless he gave man faith, man had no way of seeing back into the world he came from. Man would only have known this world or realm. So God gave man faith so that he could have the world from which he came open up to him again. The world before time. Now we are running out of time. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore the years to you that the canker worm has eaten. How is that going to happen if we're running out of time? Well, I'll tell you how. A year is coming as a month, a month is coming as a week, and a day is coming as an hour. Time as we know it is growing short because our time is moving into eternity. Now, I want you to understand this. I know that you uh, you identify with this because everybody I talk to uh, agrees that it used to be that, you know, your day would drag on and on and on. Now, you practically just get to work and it's time to go home. Or, especially if you're having fun, you just get up and it's time to go to bed. <laughs> you know, I mean, the day just goes by and you say, well, what happened to the day? It came as an hour. So, the blessing is an empowerment to prosper. The blessing is God's ability on your ability, giving you the supernatural ability to do what you couldn't do before. The blessing is released through words. God blessed Sarah and told her that she would be the mother of, a na of nations in Genesis 17, 16. I will bless her and, sh and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to others. God blessed Abraham so that all families of the earth would be blessed through him. Genesis 12, 1-3 The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God wants you to be a distribution center. A distribution center is a funnel by which God can release his favor through you to prevent misfortune in someone else's life. God won't just bless you for your benefit. He will bless you so that you can help others. Allow God to use you to be a blessing to others. And if you're born again, God has blessed you. 
Ephesians 1 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You must connect with the blessing on your life by faith. Now, I want to briefly talk to you about the blessing or the curse. When something from this world happens to you, what do you do? Do you whine and cry, why me? Or do you take dominion and authority over the situation or circumstance right then? Well, let me tell you what you should be doing. As a believer, you must, first and foremost, go immediately to the Bible and see what God says uh, uh, about your situation in his, in his word. Number one, find out what God's word says about your situation. Having established what God says about it, usually that you don't have to endure it, you must keep in mind the following. Number two, whatever is contrary to the word of God is the curse. People who are living in the world under the dictates of situations and circumstances, under bondage of those things, are living in a space I'm going to be calling the delayed curse. In other words, they get a little bit of relief from the situation or circumstance, but they can't seem to attain the fullness of the blessing. Then things begin to go right for them for a while. Then they get happy. Then all of a sudden, boom, the onset of some horrible thing happens to them. That is the delayed curse. It's not the blessing in operation, my friends. Believe me. Well, then just how do I find out how the blessing works? Well, once I find it, how do I learn how to operate in it? You find it in God's word. Keep this in mind. No word, no blessing. Let's take a look at... at um, First of all, let me take a look at, at, I want to say something else about this. Your circumstances, excuse me, your circumstances that you're under undergoing, your situation, um, if it's negative, is coming from the enemy. It's coming from the devil. And the reason that I say that is because the Bible tells us that. And all good things and all good gifts come from the Father of lights, which is God in heaven. And he doesn't give you sickness and disease to teach you a lesson. That's a, a lie from the pit of hell. But what I'm saying to you is this. Um, the enemy cannot reach God. He, he hates God, and he wants to just annihilate God. He wants to sit above him and be bigger and better than him, and he thinks he is, all right? But we know, that, we know better than that. He's not. Nothing is better and greater than God. So the enemy can't get into the third heaven to attack God. So what does he do? He attacks his image. He attacks his likeness. We are small G, folks. Uh, we're not near what God is, but we have his attributes, remember, and his characteristics. That's why we look like him. Uh, physically, we're speaking spirits just like he is, but and our physical body may not be what he has because he's not a, he doesn't have a physical body. But spiritually speaking, we look just like him. We're speaking spirits, and he's given us his DNA, his attributes, his characteristics. So the devil attacks us because we look like him. He recognizes the the. Uh, uh, attributes of God and he comes after us so if something bad is happening in the world then why is it happening because Satan has the enemy he's the enemy and he can attack uh, what looks like God and he comes after that us okay so remember keep this in mind no word in your heart no word in your mind no blessing let's take a look at the root of the curse how does the curse come on us well the curse comes by fear Fear is the forerunner of the curse. You're going along fine, and then you listen to the news, and you hear that the economy is shot, and folks are losing their jobs, and you begin to worry as to whether you might lose yours. What is that? Fear. Remember, remember me telling you that you're always in some kind of faith? Well, you are. If you're not in faith and, and walking in God's word, then you're in the curse. And if, you th if things don't seem uh, to be too bad right now, but on the horizon it looks pretty bleak, and you are doing all you can to ensure that you won't be affected by the situation, then you are in the delayed curse. How do I know this? Because God's word tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Now, how does fear come? It comes by the same way. Fear or the curse comes by hearing the evil reports. From whom? From where? From the news, from naysayers, from everybody, your friends, your family. Anytime you listen to things that are contrary to God's word, you will eventually put action to those negative thoughts and fears. And you know what will happen? You'll find yourself locked into, the operating, uh, locked into and operating in the curse. Now, remember this. If you're born again, you're a child of God. You're in Christ. You're Abraham's seed. Therefore, you are heir to the blessing. Now, if you think you're not rich, then you're in fear of not having enough. You're living in the curse. When you realize that you are Abraham's seed and heir to the blessing, that the blessing and all the prosperity that comes with it 
is uh, that belongs to Jesus, belongs to you, belongs to God, then the things you want and need are already yours. It's only a matter of however long it takes you to get them to manifest from the supernatural into the natural into your hands. And that depends on your faith level. You see, the more you believe God and His Word, then the quicker those items will manifest to you. But when you are pulled to and fro on every wave of doctrine, it will take a long time. Because that way of believing is double-minded. Now, most Christians live in the delayed curse. They get the residue off the splash of the blessing as it passes them by, and they think they've been blessed. And it's simply the delayed curse. Good. Now, but only as long as they can keep their thoughts. You know, I mean, it's good right now, all right? But only as long as they can keep their thoughts positive. But somehow they find themselves slipping in down that slippery slope into believing what the world says and not consulting God on what he has to say about it. So they continue to live in the delayed curse, always wondering why God doesn't bless them fully. Sound familiar? All right. Confess that you are blessed and that the blessing is working in you, on you, and around you. Okay? Then develop a blessing consciousness. Don't allow circumstances to affect your confidence in the blessing on your life. Avoid sin because it's a blessing blocker. The blessing will make you rich and adds no sorrow or stress to your life. Proverbs 10.22 the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. So being rich is not limited to financial wealth, though it includes money. A person may be rich in material goods but lacking in spiritual prosperity or other areas of his life. Revelation 3.17 says, You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. <laughs> I mean... His mind, his mind is blinded. His eyes can't see. To be rich is to be very, very whole in every area of your life. Spirit, soul, body, finances, and relationships. When the blessing is on your life, it's all good. You're not rich until every area of your life is whole with nothing missing or lacking. Prosperity is like a pie made up of several slices, each one being an aspect of the prosperous life. For example, healing, money, deliverance, a healthy marriage, that kind of thing. The enemy stole pieces of the prosperity pie when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, but Jesus restored the whole prosperity pie through his death and resurrection. So if something seems to be a blessing, but yet you are stressed out, depressed, and doubt and struggling to hold on to it, it's not a blessing from God. The blessing brings with it sweatless victory, my friends. False prosperity is acting as if you are prosperous when in reality you're still lacking in areas of your life. You're struggling behind the scenes to keep your level of life up. There are sleepless nights. Then your wife says, I need new clothes. I need a new car, but I just got ahead. Have a little extra cash. Not anymore. The dishwasher broke and I have to get a new one. Funds are depleted. You begin to seek a second and a third job to keep, it, keep that level of life going. That, my friends, is false prosperity. Keeping up with the Joneses is also false prosperity. You know... Uh, there was a commercial on TV on this guy's riding on a, a riding lawnmower. This has been, oh, last year. Anyway, and he's driving along, and they say, oh, look at my house. He says, look at my cars. Look at my this, that, and the other, and all these things, all these toys that he has, my boat, and everything. And then he said, as he's driving off, he says, somebody help me. You know, why? Because it's false prosperity. He's so buried in debt that he can't get out. And the commercial was for a loan company, so go figure. So... When the blessing is on your life, though, the glory or physical manifestation of the blessing will be seen by others. Did you know that? That's right. Abraham was blessed, and it was seen in the abundance of material wealth that he possessed. Genesis 13, 1 and 2. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock, in silver and gold. Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. He gave him his blessing. Genesis 25, 5 and 11. Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Beer Lahai Roy. Uh, and Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, was also rich because of his connection to Abraham. Now you see, I want you to understand something. Lot's increase came because of who he was associated with. Be mindful of your associations, because you can connect either to a blessing or a curse. The blessing can be released when you sow your finances into the life of an anointed man or woman of God. Abraham won a war, took the spoils of the battle, found a priest to whom he could give a tithe or tenth of his goods. Abraham gave to Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem. Genesis 14, 18 through 23. 
Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram God, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, and you keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Melchizedek released that, the blessing by speaking words over Abraham. And I want you to know something. When Abraham made this statement to, to the uh, uh, king of Sodom, um, he made a he made a uh, an oath or a vow to God. He said, "I will, won't accept anything belonging to earthly man." In other words, in other words, he's not saying, "King, you're my 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 uh, source. I look to you to give me stuff." See, because that's the way it is in the kingdom. The king is in charge of his kingdom, and all the subjects that live there. He is responsible for, and if they're not taking good care of the king is taking good care of his subjects, and there's lack in poverty, and they're not well fed, even though they're worker bees, you know, if they're not well well taken care of, then that's a reflection on the king. And so, Abraham was saying, God is my source. He will always be my one and only source. I raised my hand to him, in a, in a vow, and I swore an oath to him that I would never ever take anything from anybody else unless he put it in my hand you see so he said that so that he was be able to say that no one could say well it was mankind that made Abram rich now then as I said Melchizedek released the blessing by speaking words over Abraham he blessed Abraham and let's look at that this is really something you need to see for yourself Blessed be Abram, the man of the Most High God, the professor of heaven and earth, possessor, I'm sorry, of heaven and earth. Abram had a covenant with God. He was blessed and walked in the blessing. He had the same blessing that Adam had on him. Adam was given dominion and possession of heaven and earth. He gave it away. And God blessed Noah with the same blessing. Then he made a covenant with Abram and walked in blood to seal it. Abraham knew who he was. He knew he walked in the blessing because God had told him he was blessed. He called him blessed. He spoke the blessing over him. However, Melchizedek didn't know Abram, never saw him before in his life. Abram looked for a priest that he could give the tithe of spoils of the war that he had just fought into the kingdom of God. When he came, Melchizedek knew this about him. He knew he was blessed. He spoke it out, blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, and he knew he was blessed and called out the blessing, who is the possessor of heaven and earth? Praise God. We are Abraham's seed. That blessing is ours as well. We possess heaven and earth. It's on us, my friends. We are the possessors of heaven and earth. The dominion was spoken into Abram's life, and we, his seed, were promised the same blessing. It is time we begin to walk in our blessing. Amen? Now, Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 6.20, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. All right, Jesus has already declared us blessed. When you give your tithes and offerings to an anointed man or woman of God, you're sowing into the anointing of God. You give of your finances in exchange for the blessing. You give of your time in exchange for the blessing. The blessing is the root to the fruit of the material wealth and prosperity that we desire. The blessing is in and on our life. Activate it daily. Give thanks to God that you are the blessed, the empowered, and walk in that original blessing daily. Praise God. Can you see how powerful this is? Now, next week, we're going to uh, delve in deeper into God's Word and look at how the power of the blessing operates in our lives today and how we make sure that it's continually operating in and for us. Did you receive this today? I pray you did. If you have questions or you need further assistance with understanding the message, contact me. Now, I want to remind you that you may tune in on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays at 3 p.m. Pacific Time for continued master classes here on Spreaker.com. To contact us, our website is www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. Email us at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet at cox.net or mthsprayer at cox.net. 
Remember, Proverbs 4, 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You know what? Make sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. That's vitally important. You know, the Master's Touch is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. And that is the Master's Touch Master Class is a subsidiary. So until I see you on tomorrow, uh, we'll go in deeper with this a little bit tomorrow. Then uh, God bless you and uh, stay well and happy. <laughs> Amen.